Because I think depending on the part of state you're in, you're, you'll have a different perspective on the migrant education program and what we can do. Um, so yeah, we've had migratory children in Caribou. Uh, we've had migratory children in the Waterville area. Um, I don't know, you know, I'm not from uh, like Waterville in between Augusta and Bangor. Uh, I call it the Dairy Belt, but I'm from Portland. So I don't know, that just might be a, a Southern Maine kind of thing. Um, we've had stop. my... Go ahead. I'll just jump in to say Raquel um, teaches in her district includes uh, Clinton. So exactly. definitely part of the dairy belt. Yep. Right, right. Uh, lots of dairies uh, in that part of the state. And yeah, we've had students, you know, um, where their families work on the dairies, uh, you know, families that live in Scarborough that may work at like Reedy Seafood, um, you know, doing pro lobster processing and things like that. Um, so, yeah, we've had, you know, migratory children all across the state. Uh, Raquel, I see you're unmuting, so I, I want to give you space. Okay. Hi, uh, yes, we have lots of families in uh, in Clinton, and I think we have one, two, two families in um, Lawrence High School in Benton, and I think that's it. So pretty much, they are mostly located in uh, in Clinton. Right. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, so what I wanted to do is just chat a little about the migrant education program, what we do, how it's structured within the state of Maine. And then at the end, I'm hoping we could just have a little bit of a discussion, um, thinking about the students that you work with, the students that you know within your district, um, you know, who might qualify for the migrant education program. And if they do, what kind of services uh, do they provide? Uh, before we do that, does anybody know if they have Migratory children, students that qualify for the migrant education program, do you know if you have them? Just a, a thumbs up. Okay, great. Looks like we have one person. Awesome. Um, so that's good. That's a good kind of starting point here. Um, we're going to talk about, yeah, what, what the program is and what that looks like. So I always prepare a bunch of slides. Um, but I don't go through every single one of them. I kind of jump around a little bit, um, especially because we I don't want to take up the whole, you know, 30 or so minutes just talking. I'd rather have this be a discussion. So um, I'm hoping to chat between the, you know, back and forth here for 20 or so minutes. Hang on for any questions and then I'll let Re Rebecca take take the rest of the time there. OK. Um, so just. In a nutshell, um, the main migrant education program, it is a federal education program. Um, so it's funded by the US Department of Education and the states run the program. Um, in the state of Maine, uh, we contract a nonprofit organization called Mono and Mono, um, where they have coordinators throughout the state that they identify, enroll, and serve all of the migratory children in Maine. Um, is anyone familiar with Mono and Mono's work? Like Heidi is. Okay. Uh, what if how what if you worked with Mono with Heidi? Just if you have an example. Well, at this point, we have um, I just cover the ESOL program, and they a lot of the times that the migrant population intersects with that. In the in my situation right now, we have migrant families that don't qualify for ESOL. So our district is trying to figure out who the responsibility, who's responsible for that role. I kind of have a feeling it's going to end up on me, but that hasn't been made official. So my um, experience with this company, excuse me, this agency is that they uh, hand delivered paperwork to us um, to be filled out for a school needs assessment. Um, when it's completed, they come in and they help the school meet the students' needs, help with communication between the parents and the school. They provide support services through the summer, um, uh, materials, anything of that sort. So they sounded like a really rich type of resource. And I don't mean rich in money. I mean, a really depth, a really deep depth of knowledge on how to help us and our families work together. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Heidi. So you just touched on so many of the things that we're going to talk about here. Um, so, you know, before getting into the specifics of the program, uh, just thinking about the staff 
for uh, Mono and Mono and the Migrant Education Program. They're located throughout the state. Um, I think, yeah, we kind of have a little map here. Um, this is Leslie. She's the program coordinator um, for Mono and Mono. Um, Diana Ortiz is in Western Washington County. Um, they just hired somebody. Her name is Lydia. She is in Eastern Washington County. Um, Augustine um, is in Central and Northern Maine. Um, actually, not pictured as Diana. This is Eva. She's in the Southern part of Maine. So, um, yeah, if, if anyone ever reaches out to you about the Migrant Education Program, it's going to be one of these staff members. And um, really, the benefit of working with Mono and Mono is, um, you know, they have the Migrant Education Program, but they also have so many other programs that um, they work with. So even if, you know, they might meet with the family, if you all make a referral to us um, and they don't qualify for the Migrant Education Program, uh, the program, they do so many other things that um, they're always, you know, they're able to make a referral or, you know, advocate for the family um, or get them access to, you um, you know, any other kind of, uh, you know, urgent needs that they have. So it's really great to partner with them um, with this migrant education program. Um, so one of the things that Heidi mentioned is, you know, we have, uh, we have what we might think of a um, migrant student. Um, that comes with a lot of preconceptions. You know, what is a migrant student, right? Um, you know, if we were to just brainstorm, close your eyes, what makes up a migrant student? Uh, what are some words, maybe other than what's on the on the um, screen here, what are some words that come to mind when you think of a migrant student? I think of um, frequent moving. Moving often, right? Totally. Agriculture. Yeah. Agriculture. Great. Thank you, Kathy. The families that I've worked with in the past when I was a CDS case manager, um, they always, the families always wanted better for their children hmm. uh, than what the parents had done. So the parents were so, um, education was so important and the parents were as invested as possible because they wanted better for their children. That's great. Thank you, Heidi. Interrupted education. Okay, right. So moving come with moving comes interruption. That's right. Uh, great. Those are some some um, you know just right. Close your eyes. What comes to mind? Those are all great things. Um, you know what also might come to mind is what you might see on the news, right? So if you if the word migrant pops up when you're watching television, uh, typically might mean um, immigrant. Right, somebody moving from one country to another, uh, in particular, you know, moving from another country to the United States, especially. Um, so, you know, that's the kind of the challenging part of the program for us is separating the public uh, perception of what a migrant family or what a migrant child is, um, and really explaining our definition of a migratory child, uh, which, you know, they can be, you know, they can be similar. Um, but we have a very specific definition here. Um, so in short, you know, for a migratory child uh, to be in the migrant education program in Maine, um, they have to get a certificate of eligibility completed. So the Mono and Mono staff, you know, one of these um, lovely staff members, they have to meet with the family and complete a certificate of eligibility in order for those students um, to qualify and receive our services. Um, so we are the basically the ultimate determining factor if somebody is a migratory child. Um, that's up to us to make that determination. Um, but there are also some eligibility factors that go into that decision. Um, migratory, meaning they have moved, um, working in farm or fishing, and they're eligible for free public education. Um, Migratory, it's important to note, uh, these are just families that have moved across school district lines within the past three years. So what we might think of as migratory is moving from, um, you know, moving from a country in Central America to the United States, 
we're moving from Florida to Maine. Um, but those moves could be even shorter. Uh, it could be moving from Millbridge to Ellsworth, for example. It could be moving from Augusta to Bangor, um, from Portland to South Portland even. So moving across school district lines. And uh, thinking what I think what Robin mentioned was that, you know, uh, this program is about educational interruption. And that's the reasoning behind this, um, this regulation is that across district lines, if you move across one district to another, there comes, you know, educational disruption with that. So moving across district lines within the past three years. And then after that move, uh, you begin work in agriculture or fishing industries. So we see a few examples of that kind of work here. Uh, does anyone know what he's doing here? What our guy out, out in the woods is doing here? Mm -hmm. Christmas trees or wreaths? Wreath yeah, making. Christmas wreaths. Yeah, you got it. Wreath making. Uh, that's exactly right. So um, huge industry in down east Maine and Washington County. Uh, we have families that move from, uh, from Florida, from Mexico, from Central America, from Haiti, uh, from all kinds of places uh, in you know, October, November, December. They're putting all those wreaths together. Uh, and many of those wreaths, you know, a lot of them are sold, but many of them end up in Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, wreaths across, across America, if you've ever seen that kind of uh, parade. Matt, can I interrupt with a question about eligibility um, based yes. on uh, farm work or fishing? Um, two things. Uh, someone who couldn't be here today asked me to ask about construction workers. They have some, some students in their district who um, are, you know, the families what do I want to say? There, there's someone who owns a construction company who brings in people from other places to work. And so those, the, the children of those folks are moving here for like construction contracts and then they move somewhere else when they're done. That's not farm work or fishing. So would they potentially qualify as, as migratory? Right. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So Construction typically will not qualify. Uh, most of the time, it will not qualify. It would have to be in a in a very specific agricultural setting, um, mm, like okay. building, chi building chicken coops. Um, you know, things like that may qualify, uh, but construction typically does not. Okay, and I have a follow up question okay. about um, the farm work related to dairies um, because I've worked a lot in Central Maine. Um, I did work with many students who whose parents lived and worked on dairy farms. And years ago, before your time at the DOE, uh, I did have a conversation um, with the migrant education program about those students because they weren't being picked up. And I was given the explanation that because those folks work year round on the farms, they would not qualify. But my experience is that some do stay some stay for a long time, but mostly families, they might move from Clinton to Pittsfield or, you know, some, some other like Knox, you know, they might move several times within five years, kind of trying to find a good fit or like better housing or, you know, um, if they're moving in less than a three year span that they would qualify. Right. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I kind of want to follow up with both of those about the construction okay. and about the dairy piece. Okay. Um, for the construction families, yes. So construction work may typically, you know, it probably won't qualify. But what we find with a lot of families, um, when they moved often, a lot of them move for different kinds of work. So it could be that a year ago or two years ago, they moved and they did for a short amount of time agriculture or fishing work. Um, and that's something that we ask about. Um, and when we get to the end, we have a, a little survey that we ask schools to fill out with families. Mm -hmm. um, there's a space on there where you can indicate, you know, this kind of work has has happened within the past three years, even though they're not doing it in Maine right now. Okay. So that's kind of a good thing to think about if you're ever talking with a family and filling out the survey and enrolling a child in school. Um, you know, talking and thinking about what kind of work have they done over the past three years? 
Um, okay. Yeah. That's uh, great. Thank you. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, for the dairy work. So there's this really important part of migrant education program eligibility. Uh, there's this temporary mm -hmm. or seasonal clause. Um, mm -hmm. so just look, yeah. So just looking at kind of the, some of the things on here, you know, these got these individuals are out raking blueberries. You can only rake blueberries. You know, sometimes it's two weeks, maybe it lasts up to a month, right? Like this is very seasonal work. It only lasts for a certain amount of time. Um, similar thing with broccoli work. Um, although, you know, those workers might come in April and they leave in October. You know, it's like a big season. Um, tipping wreaths, there's a certain time of year when you tip the wreath. Um, you know, this work only lasts for a couple of months during the Christmas season. Um, so the challenge with, you know, uh, identifying and enrolling uh, people that work in dairies is that a cow, you know, they need to be milked twice a day, every day. 365 mm -hmm. days a year. Um, so a lot of them may not qualify for the program if they've been there for a long time or if they plan on being there for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. But the 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 cutoff there is 12 months. Um, so if they work longer than a year, then they wouldn't qualify for the program. Um, mm -hmm. If they work less than a year, then they would qualify for the program. So it's like mm -hmm. that over under 12 months. Um, and oh. So yeah. to follow up on that, if you, for example, um, have a student register and their family has moved to your area to work in a dairy, it would depend on their intention of staying a long time or a short time? Uh, yes. So that's kind of the challenge of, yeah, talking to a family is you get an understanding of how long they plan on um, staying and working at the dairy. Yep. Um, okay. And that is something where we're not necessarily asking for you all to make that determination. Um, if you have somebody that moves to your area and begins working in a dairy, mm -hmm. um, you know, we ask if you send in the information, then we'll follow up with the family, um, and, and sit down with them in their homes and have a conversation about it. Okay. Thank um, you. Yeah. And oftentimes what might happen with dairy workers is that, um, they will indicate they plan on staying and working at this place for a very long time. But then you ask about the last dairy they were at and they said, you know, oh, I was there for a few months or I was there for six months. Right. Um, so that's just kind of the, part of the interview or the conversation we have with families um, when we sit down with them to see if they qualify. Thanks for explaining that. Yeah, thanks for asking. Oh, uh, yeah. So, you know, migratory means moving from one district to another. Uh, farming and fishing work, um, working kind of temporarily in one of those industries, um, and then eligible for free public education. Uh, this one's pretty straightforward for a lot of you. You're working with kids um, in school, um, so they qualify uh, for free public education. Um, so what I'll add on top of this, I uh, just was looking at some of the numbers uh, for our migratory children in Maine schools. Um, this is just over the past few years. Um, you know, you can see it's a fairly even split, you know, around 500 um, migratory children over the past several years are multilingual. Um, then there are around 700 that are not. Um, so multilingual children are a big, um, they're a big portion of our migrant education program. Um, this this actually looks pretty different compared to a lot of other states, a lot of other programs um, throughout the country. Maine's migratory uh, population is a little unique um, in that, you know, a lot of our families do speak Spanish, um, but we also have a lot of families that, um, you know, they only speak English or uh, they speak English and a, an indigenous language. Um, they're from the Passamaquoddy communities, for example. Uh, we have families that moved down from Canada to work in the blueberry season during the summer. So, um, you know, I bring this up to show a lot of you all as, you know, multilingual and ESOL and English learning, um, English learner specialists, uh, you all will, you know, likely um, 
you're the community that's going to come in contact with migratory children quite a bit. Um, so yes, many of our students are multilingual. Mm. Um, yeah, so I do want to talk about kind of what we might do to support migratory children. Um, one thing I always like to ask is just, okay, so we talked about who a migratory child is. Um, you know, what, what kind of challenges come with being a migratory child? Uh, somebody in the migrant education program, uh, what kind of challenges are there uh, that, you know, Congress authorized this program um, and authorized funds to be used to support migratory children? Like, what is the purpose for that? And why do you think that it was created? Well, it seems like they have an awful lot of interrupted schooling if they're moving around seasonally. Exactly. Uh, and with interrupted schooling comes what? Probably challenges in learning, <laughs> being Sorry. behind academically, perhaps, or grade level wise. Right. Um, yeah. So moving from one grade to another can be a challenge, especially when you get to that high school level. Um, you know, get gaining credits. If you're moving at different times of the year, um, it can be really challenging um, to make sure that those credits are accepted at one school, um, especially if you leave in the middle of a course. Healthcare services, um, being able to stay up to date with vaccinations, dental appointments, um, you know, continuity of healthcare, and particularly for children who have chronic health conditions. And when they move, connecting with um, the proper care providers and how to access those services. Um, if a child has special needs, um, not having a lag in time, um, moving from one district to another to get the OTPT or whatever um, that student might need. Because quite often the parents, um, for a variety of reasons may not be comfortable to be able to advocate for uh, those services for their students, for their children rather. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Robin. Uh, you just touched on so much. Um, yeah, so, you know, farming and fishing work is dangerous work. Uh, you know, there's large machinery, there are pesticides, there are, um, you know, dangerous work conditions. You think about being on a tall ladder and picking apples, right? So um, there's there's a lot of health concerns that come with it. Um, you know, moving from place to place and keeping all of your paperwork, right? Like going to enroll your child in school and making sure you have your vaccinations, um, you know, paperwork ready. So uh, th there are a lot of challenges like that, that that come with moving and the paperwork part of it can be difficult. I'm a new dad and, um, you know, I'm just, I just, just like completing daycare paperwork. I'm like, okay, I need the birth certificate. I need this, I need this, I need this. Like, I'm still learning. I'm like, gosh, I don't know how, everybody keeps this so organized. So, you know, moving around so often is only going to, um, you know, increase the chance for some of that paperwork gets lost. Um, and then, yeah, you mentioned kind of um, IEP, you know, special needs um, and like special education services from the school. So getting that paperwork transferred and getting the students um, the services they need as soon as possible. Um, so, you know, the migrant education program and the Mono a Mono team they do a really good job of figuring out what those needs are and trying to fill the gap. Um, so just one of the, you know, every student we recruit, we enroll into the program, we complete these needs assessments. And I think it was Heidi that was um, kind of going through it here. Um, we, we complete a family needs assessment with the family uh, to ask from their perspective, what can we support them with? So, you know, how are things going? Um, what is what is your child interested in? Uh, what do they do well at? What do they need help with? All those kinds of things. Um, medical, uh, you know, housing needs, food insecurity, all of those kinds of things. We're talking with the family in their homes every single year um, to see what we can do to support that. Uh, we also complete school needs assessments. So, not only we get the family's perspective on things, we get the school's perspective on things. Um, 
so you know what are their educational goals uh what are their challenges to that what are their strengths um and we just have a conversation with school staff that know the family that know the child um and we really try to fill the gaps like okay what is the school providing um how is that going how is the child responding um and then what can the migrant education program do on top of that to make sure the family is getting what they need um, so this kind of school needs assessment, family needs assessment is really informing our plan to serve the child. Um, you know, we find some of our children have um, specific tutoring needs. You know, they're, they're doing pretty well, but there's this one specific subject that isn't working out. Um, so we have tutors across the state that either meet with families in their homes or they meet, um, we, they do it virtually um, over Zoom that we have tutors that do that as well. Um, Matt, can you address uh, the FERPA questions that arise with yeah. that school needs assessment? Yes. Um, because in, in helping people to understand that piece of it. Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, first of all, every time we enroll a child into the migrant education program, uh, the family is agreeing to um, you know, agreeing to let us talk to the school and uh, request kind of educational information like transcripts, assessment scores, health requests, um, and any other needs we might get through the school needs assessment uh, and things like that. So um, just by, by being enrolled into the migrant education program, um, they are basically authorizing us to, um, to access that kind of information. So um, Mono and Mono acts on behalf of the Department of Education in this regard. Um, so there's no concern about uh, privacy or FERPA violations in sharing the information with um, with the with the migrant education program and Mono and Mono staff. Um, on top of that, uh, every time we enroll a child into the program, we get a signature specifically saying, uh, you know, the, the family is authorizing us to um, to contact the family or contact the school to complete the needs assessment. That's great. Thank you for bringing. Thank you for bringing that up, Robin. Matt, can I ask a related question to that? Yes. Yep. Um, a couple, actually. Okay. Is there a way that the ESL teacher would know that the student also receives migrant education services? Um, is is there a way to find that out? Hmm. Yeah, so talking with your data team might be a good place to start there and your child nutrition team. So uh, once a child is enrolled into the migrant education program. At the Department of Education, we document that in NEO and on the direct certification list um, that your child nutrition team is is polling. So um, those are a couple places to start. Um, that that just from a data perspective, that's where we mark them in Neo on our attending student details report. Um, they are marked as migrant, um, and on the direct certification list for your child nutrition for free lunch, um, they are also marked as migrant. Um, beyond that, uh, it's really about who we get connected with at the school district or at the school. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we start with. You know, maybe the guidance counselor, if we don't have luck there, we'll talk to, you know, the, the multilingual staff. If we don't have luck there, we'll talk to the principal. If we're still not getting luck, we're going to call the superintendent and try to get in touch with somebody that really knows the family. I will mm -hmm. tell you, they will show up at your doorstep. <laughs> right. <laughs> Eva and I have been going back and forth and they showed up uh, as August, August. I'm sorry, I can't pronounce his name correctly. Anyway, right. he showed up like two weeks ago at our door and said, hey, look, you have this family and let me help you. They are very helpful. Um, I've had a fantastic experience with them so far. Um, I, I do have a question though. Yep. Um, so if we have, because our, I'm assuming every district has this, that there is a formal, are you involved in a migrant Program, are, are you a my uh, a migrant like with the farm workers and all that stuff that's in our paperwork for our parents to fill out if that's filled out 
And as the parents have said, yes, I am in farming or whatever, I am assuming that goes somewhere to you guys, maybe. I don't know where it goes from there because I do know that we have some families here that are involved in your program and some who are not, mm -hmm. but they all checked off migrants. So I don't know who is and who isn't. I don't know how that works. Yep. Um, yeah. So what you're referring to is our school survey. So, um, you know, we ask districts um, to put this in a school registration packet for every student every year. Um, and after the form is filled out, if the questions are answered yes, then it's sent into the Department of Education. It's sent to me. Um, and from there, I share it with the Mono and Mono team for them to follow up with the family and determine eligibility. Um, we document every single survey we get in a spreadsheet, and we know what the result of every single survey was. So if you ever have a question about, okay, you know, I sent in this survey, or I'm not sure if this family completed a survey, you can always reach out to me um, or, you know, Augustine, and we'll be able to look in our spreadsheet and tell you if we got a form for the family, and if we did, what happened, and do they qualify? So do I do that using their student ID number? Because I don't have a release. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. I mean, yeah, I guess you'd just be asking, I mean, you'd be asking us if they qualify for the migrant education program uh, at the Department of Ed. I can always look up a student and see if they qualify. Um, okay. And if they don't exist in our records as completing a school survey, um, I'd be able to just tell you yes or no. Okay. Um, you know, if they fill out the form, they're agreeing to, um, you know, be contacted and surveyed for the program. Um, so there's kind of no, um, there's not a much of a concern there. Okay, thank you. Um, it, it'd be um, helpful, Heidi, if you quite often, it's the, you know, office, somebody in the school office that's going through those forms, looking for the yeses or the noes um, and, and pulling the yeses. And I'm sure every school or district has its own policy about, you know, is there a, a list kept? Like who's ever sending those off to the DOE? You know, do they keep a list? Okay. That's so that you, you could even refer to the list of what forms got sent out. I would think yeah. that there would be a list kept. There is, and everything's electronic. So I can check that on a weekly basis. But my, and I was kind of wondering, okay, I have this family. Where are they in the status of the wheelhouse of migrant? Have they been yeah. surveyed? So yeah, no, we, that's, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm on, I'm working on it, but I don't know if it's going to be my responsibility, but I just want to make sure I understand the process. So thank you. Yeah, I think if, if you don't know if they qualify for the program, um, having them fill out this form and sending it in to me, um, you know, sometimes families fill out this form, they might not entirely understand what they're filling out. We try to make it pretty intuitive, you know, circle if you've done this kind of work and have you moved are really the big questions we're looking for. If the answers on here don't align to three yeses, but you really think that they will qualify, you can always send that information to us and we can follow up with the family. Um, you know, this is just a simple way to sort them out is making sure they've moved and done this kind of work. But if you have a feeling and the family, you know, could need the services or interested in the services, you could always just fill this out with them and send it directly to us. And we'll contact the family just to see if they do qualify and be sure. So is this the form that is the formal form that should be included in our digital package to parents? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, this is not what it looks like when I see it. So that's what I just want to make sure. Yeah. So thanks for bringing that up. We've seen a lot of, um, a lot of confusion with this form, with the, um, electronic or digital registration processes. Um, so I've worked with a couple of districts, um, Lewiston and Portland, on figuring out how to get this format into um, a digital registration 
um, kind of packet. So I could forward that process to you, Heidi, if you'd like to see it. That would be great, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is really our biggest tool in finding students across the state. Uh, we only have so many students, we only get so much funding that we're unable to be in every school or in every school district. Um, and this is really the best way for schools to support us and finding the students that may qualify for our services. So if there is one ask, you know, if you don't have migrant students now, if you think you might, uh, going back to your school and your administration and figuring out, is this in our registration packets? Um, and if not, how can we get it in there to make sure we're screening students um, for eligibility? Um, so I would be the person, if you do have any questions about this, you can always reach out to me, um, send me an email or um, give me a phone call. I'd be happy to chat. Um, so I handle a lot of things from the state's uh, perspective. Um, you know, it's my contact information here. If you have anything about, you know, a migrant student that you already have, or you have a question about the services we're providing, or if you want to get in contact with one of the coordinators, but you don't remember their phone number, um, Leslie is a really good person to reach out to. She works for Mono and Mono, um, and she is the, the director of the program there. Um, so yeah, kind of just in, you know, um, in review, uh, the program, you know, there's uh, the term migrant comes with a lot of things, but uh, we're very specific about uh, families that move and work in agriculture or fishing. Um, and with all of those things come, come certain needs. And um, a lot of times, you know, schools may or may not have the resources or the staff to be able to meet all of those needs. So that's where the migrant education program comes in. Um, you know, we find out what the family is going through, how we can support them, and then serve them. Um, so that's that's kind of our our mission here. We talk to everybody, find what they need, and figure out a way to support them and in, in their educational goals. Um, so that took took a little while, uh, but I appreciate kind of the questions and the conversation and the back and forth here. So, um, yeah, thanks for thanks Great. for joining. <laughs> Thank you so much, Matt. I really appreciate it. That was really interesting and informative. Awesome. Thanks for coming today.